the subject move from dealing with uncertainties to identify a sort of certain trend uh, among uh, a large number of the data or information. So um, um, uh, we are very um, fortunate to have a uh, study uh, for the ready for the presentations by Dr. Uh, Nao Suda um, from Bank of Japan. And Dr. Uh, Nao Sudo is the director and head of the economic and financial studies divisions in the Institute for the Monetary and Economic Studies, uh, Bank of Japan, which is our host. And um, he has published uh, a number of the articles on wide uh, varieties of, uh, of the topic, including macroeconomics and mon uh, monetary policies, including um, population aging, uh, real interest rates, and the quantifying uh, standard uh, flow effect of the uh, QE and the productivities uh, in Japan. So, and then uh, his presentation will be followed by um, dis discussions by uh, Mr. Mark Wayne from Dallas uh, Fed. So, Dr. Sudo, you have the floor. First of all, thank you, Chair, for the detailed introduction. So, I really thank uh, this opportunity to present our paper in front of this great audience, privileged as a host. And this um, work is joint work with Ko Munakata, Takeshi Shinohara, Shigenori Shiratsuka and Tsutomu Watanabe and Ko and uh, Shigenori uh, right here and, the, um, and Takeshi is operating here. And this paper is about seasonal cycles and synchronization of price changes in Japan. And the question we are going to ask in this paper, there are three questions. And number one is how do seasonal cycles look like? And the second is how do seasonal cycles occur? And the, how, and the third is what are the macroeconomic implications of the seasonal cycles? And we are going to show what we are going to argue that the, for the first question, we are going to show that there are two peaks in frequency of price changes that are synchronized across directions, namely ups and downs, and also across categories. And I'm also going to show that there is negative correlation between frequency and size of price changes. And for the second question, we are going to argue that there are a season cycles in menu costs. And for the last question, we are going to argue months matter, especially for the transmission of shocks to the economy. So brief overview of the related studies. So in macro, uh, there has been um, seasonal studies on seasonal cycles, but mostly for quantity variables rather than price changes. And the well-known ex well example includes uh, the Myron and Brodsky, or Echeketi and Kashap, and former studies the, um, and document season cycles and report that the, there are similarities between season cycles and business cycles. And the latter studied the relationship between the season cycles and business cycle. Although not really focusing on season cycles itself, but there is a, a paper by Olive and Tenreiro. And this paper is really um, close um, to ours in the sense that they focusing on Japanese economy and the focusing on the specific types and aspect of seasonal cycles, we are uh, paying a lot of attention. So what they do is they estimate impulse response function of output to monetary policy shocks, but they fo focus on in which quarter monetary policy shocks occur and find that the whenever monetary policy shocks occur in the first quarter in Japan, 
then the, the, in, the impact on output is muted relative to other monetary policy shocks occurring in other months. And they're arguing that there is a renegotiation of wages and therefore wages are more flexible in the first quarter relative to other quarters and that results in muted responsive output to monetary policy shocks. There are some papers that are focusing on season cycles of prices and seminal paper by Nakamura and Steinson indeed list a frequency of price changes as one of the five facts. And there's also a documentation about seasonal cycles in Euro area as well. But unlike the analysis of the seasonality on quantity variables, seasonal cycles or price dynamics haven't been the central focus of these studies. Here I'm going to, uh, I'm showing the uh, decomposition of the official CPI, annual CPI into monthly changes from January, February to December. Each month is colored differently. And you can notice that the, there are a stable seasonality in a sense that there are months price always increases and there are months where price always decreases. For example, January, February, a month when prices decline, and March and September are the months where you see increases in prices. And these seasonal patterns have been somewhat stable over the sample period. So for this analysis, we use DDL scanner data provided by Nikkei, which is a daily data from January 1990 to December 2021, 575 stores for food and daily commodities, less fresh food, which corresponds to 170 items out of 588 items of the official CPI and constitute 17% uh, 70, of the CPI basket over 11 billion observations. And we focus on um, the regular prices. So we drop the, um, the sale prices. And to this end, we use the filtering. So we um, filter the data so as to get the regular prices. Before further going to the analysis, I'm going to provide a definition of the words. The definition themselves are quite a standard uh, in the literature, but just in case. So for the frequency, so frequency uh, in our analysis, is defined as a portion of products in a category that has changed the price. So uh, in the example below, you see four tofus here. Uh, you see two of the tofus see increases in prices. And in this case, we count as that the frequency of price increases for the category tofu is 0.5. We also look at a uh, size of price increases and decreases. And size here is defined as the average price changes of products that have changed the price. So again, using an example below, we say uh, for this specific case, size of price increases for category tofu is 0 0.15 because the average of the two tofus that have increased the price is 0 .0 0 0.15. Here we show the aggregate post-inflation, which is a aggregation of our scanner data. 
together with the official CPI. And of course, there are several uh, discrepancies between the two series, but there are uh, several similarities as well, in a sense that you have a higher uh, inflation rate in the early 1990s, and you have sort of like low uh, inflation rate following the early 1990s, and ups and downs around the global financial crisis is also um, similar across the two series. Because we are interested in season cycles of the series, we need to extract season cycles from the, uh, from the data. And what we do is, I think, quite straightforward. We simply regress the original series on uh, 12 monthly variables. And in order to get the time series of season cycles, we have conducted rolling estimates. But as a sensitive analysis, uh, we have used the alternative um, method to extract seasonal cycles, including X12. <coughs> Excuse me. And the results are unchanged drastically under the two alternative um, methodology for extracting season cycles. So facts about the seasonal cycles. So there are four key observations. The number one is frequency or price changes has two peaks, typically March and September. And the second is size is negatively correlated with frequency. And a seasonal cycle of the, uh, the former, the size are less pronounced and less synchronized across categories and also across directions, ups and downs. And the third is a seasonal cycles of inflation tracks seasonal cycles of net frequency, which is the difference between the frequency of upward changes and frequency of downward price changes. And the last one is season cycles of frequency have been stable over time, but they are responsive to changes in the category level inflation rate, annual inflation rate. So there are some relationship between the, um, the seasonal cycles and business cycles in terms of price dynamics. So I start with the first fact. So here you are looking at the, um, the seasonal cycles of the frequency of price changes for tofu for both price increases and price decreases. So you can see that the frequency increases in March and also in September for both directions. These two panels look at the uh, distribution of categories for all items. For price increases at the left and price decreases at the right. So you also see the similar patterns, which is two peaks in March and September for both price increases and price decreases. We try to see the two types of synchronizations the first type of synchronization we are looking at is synchronization across directions, ups and downs. So we are trying to see how, I mean, the, when firms in category tofu change the price, sorry, increase the price, whether firms in the same category decrease the price. And to see this, we compute the correlation of the frequency of price increases and price decreases for each of the categories and the draw histogram here. You can see that median of the distribution is 0.31 positive and the majority of, of the category exhibits 
statistically significant positive relationship for price increases and price decreases. The second type of synchronization we are looking at is the uh, across categories. So we are trying to see when a firms in category tofu change the price, whether firms in category say soap change the price. And again, we compute the correlation across category pairs and draw the histogram. For price increases at the left and price increases, sorry, price decreases at the right. And again, you see some uh, positive correlations for those two cases. And the majority of the category pairs exhibit statistically significant positive relationship indicating there are two types of synchronization operating for frequency of price changes. Now we look at the size for tofu first. Size declines in March and September, just flip sign of the frequency for uh, price increases and for price decreases. Please note that for the size, we look at absolute value of the change of price. And therefore, uh, higher the size of price decreases means that price are cut larger. This seasonal pattern is uh, less visible if you look at here all categories. Although uh, March and September, you still have numbers below average. We look at the correlation between the frequency and the size. So we simply, again, compute the correlation between the frequency and size for each of the categories. And we found that for price increases and also for price decreases, the relationship is negative. Which means that whenever a more firm change the prices, they change the prices a little. So magnitude of the change is small, although when a larger firm change the price. We also look at the uh, degree of synchronization for directions and also for uh, across categories for the size. But compared to the frequency of price changes, the degree of synchronization is muted and I'm going to skip the slide. So fact three, we look at the season cycles of overall inflation rate rather than frequency or the size. And the left panel shows the inflation seasonal component of inflation for tofu. And the right panel shows the um, seasonal cycles of all categories. And this pattern is indeed um, consistent with the movement of the net frequency. So we construct two variables, what we call net frequency and net size. And net frequency is, as I say in the beginning of the presentation, the difference between upward frequency and downward frequency. And not net size is um, difference between upward uh, size and downward size. And the, um, these two panels uh, show the uh, net frequency at the left and net size at the right. And net frequency roughly tracks the uh, seasonal components of inflation, suggesting that the frequency plays a relatively important role in generating the seasonal cycle of the inflation. So lastly, we look at the time series properties of seasonal cycles. And first we look at the seasonal cycles of frequency for two a different period, high inflation period and low inflation period. And high inflation period is 
denoted with the uh, blue line and the low inflation period, the median of it is denoted with a blue line with a marker. And there are two observations. One is very clear and the other is very subtle. The first one is that the seasonal pattern has been stable regardless of the rate of the inflation level for uh, both high inflation period and low inflation period that you have two peaks, March and September, and the seasonal patterns have been changed drastically. The subtle one is that the, you have more ups and downs for high inflation period for price increases and uh, less up and down for price decreases. Such relationships are not observable for the size. So the seasonal cycles for the size has been less stable over time and doesn't look like responsive to uh, inflation rate. So um, we check whether the um, ups and downs is related to the annual inflation rate or not by again looking at the standard deviation of the uh, seasonal variations within a year with the annual inflation rate of the year for price increases and for price decreases. And you see that the standard deviation is higher when inflation rate is higher for price increases, shown as the 0.38 as a median. By contrast, for price decreases, the standard deviation of the seasonal component of the frequency becomes lower, sorry, it's lower when the inflation rate is higher, yielding a negative relationship between the standard deviation and the annual inflation rate. So uh, from now on, I'm going to use a standard, a small um, state dependent model to explore the drivers of the seasonal cycles. And there are two arguments associated with seasonal cycles uh, in the literature, although not ex mutually exclusive, but a flexibility of wages pointed out by Olive and Tenreiro, and some time dependency element stressed by Nakamura and Steinson. And they are using an extended version of the state-dependent state pricing model of Nakamura and Steinson. We explore uh, which of the, uh, the elements, flexibility of wages or time dependency, is consistent with the data we found. So in a model, you have a fin infinite number of firms that differ um, in terms of the firm specific productivity and also uh, the, the last time they change the prices. And ideally, they want to set the prices with a reference to their marginal cost, but they need to pay many costs whenever they change the prices. So uh, their uh, actual price often deviates from their optimal price which we call p star. And, the, um, and this is a distribution between the, of, the, uh, of the price gap, p minus p star, in our economy. And when p minus p star, the price gap is larger, then firms are happy to change their prices even though they have to pay the menu cost. But uh, if the, the price gap is small, then because of the menu cost, they are refrained from uh, changing the prices. So 
So we construct two models, what we call model K and model omega. And the, uh, for a model K, we assume that the, uh, their menu cost has season cycles, decline in March and September. And for a model omega, we assume that the, the real wages declines, sorry, increases in March and September. And we assume that the real wages are constant for model K and menu costs are constant for model omega. And this is a simulation result we got um, for model K and model omega for frequency at the top and for the size at the bottom. And price increases is noted with a blue line with a marker and price decreases is denoted with a red line, do, red uh, dotted line. And for a model K, you see that the um, price increases and price decreases occur in the same month, mechanically because in these months, many costs are lower. You also see that the whenever you have increases in the frequency for model K, you have a decline in the size. This is because due to a decline in menu costs, even firms with a smaller price gap are incentivized to change the prices, but their price gap is small, lowering the average size of price changes, resulting a negative correlation between the frequency and size. And this observation doesn't hold for uh, model omega because as you can see, for price increases and price decreases, the frequency goes in the opposite direction because whenever you have a higher real wages, firms want to decrease the prices are less incentivized to change their prices. And for firms who want to increase the prices, they're more incentivized to increase their prices. And the models are indeed consistent for uh, fact three and fact four. And uh, this uh, figure shows the assimilation results for model K only, but with various inflation rates. And whenever you have a higher the inflation rate, you tend to have a higher, larger ups and downs in the frequency. In this table, I summarize the result, and in nutshell, the, um, the model omega fails to replicate the fact three and fact, sorry, fact one and fact two, in a sense that the uh, it generates the negative correlation between the uh, frequency or price increases and price uh, decreases, and also uh, they generate the negative correlation for the size, sorry, for, for the size, sorry, for the positive correlation for the size and frequency. So before conclude, um, I would like to discuss uh, some uh, the two points. The, the first is what are the seasonal cycles or menu costs? What do they represent? And there are, I think, two questions. Why do they change? And why are they synchronized? And I think there are two papers really relate to each of the uh, observations. And the first one is the, um, the paper by Zubraki, 2004. And they argue that the menu costs include a lot of things in addition to physical menu costs, such as uh, managerial costs and customer costs. And the, regarding the synchronization, our paper is, I think, related to the um, pioneering paper 
by Blinder, 1994, in stressing the role of coordination, he writes that the uh, firms might like to raise or lower prices, but hesitate to do so unless and until other firms move first. Once other firms move, they follow quickly. So uh, taking the results of the two studies and our own results in hand, the one possible interpretation may be there are uh, implicit coordination among firms in March and September in Japan so that known physical menu cost declines in this month. And second implication I would like to stress is, is macroeconomic implications. And it really speaks to the finding uh, by Olive and Ten Rayro, although mechanism itself is different. So uh, because of the seasonal changes in many costs, transmission of shock to the economy and price dynamics may differ depending on in which months the shocks occur. And also um, because low frequency price dynamics such as annual inflation rate are related to uh, seasonal dynamics, which equals to the findings by Cheketin Kashap and Matas Mir Osborn for quantity variables which make, make real-time analysis more difficult. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sudo, um, Dr. Wayne. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, discuss this uh, really interesting paper. I'm acutely aware of the fact that I'm the last person standing between you all and uh, a drink or something, so I'm going to try to be very brief uh, in my comments and to the point. So this paper is uh, a really interesting analysis uh, using highly disaggregated 13-digit uh, scanner data from Decay uh, documenting the timing and size of price changes in nearly 600 stores across Japan. And they look at three questions. First, what are the seasonal patterns in the data? Second, uh, what models of price adjustment are most consistent with the observed patterns? And then what are the, observed, what are the potential macroeconomic implications? And they report four uh, key results. First, the frequency and to a lesser extent the size of price changes exhibits a very um, obvious seasonal pattern. The second, uh, the seasonal pattern of the frequency of price changes is weakly negatively correlated with the size of price changes. Uh, and there's a seasonal pattern in inflation, and then these patterns seem to be um, uh, pretty stable over time. So the results in this paper uh, complement in many ways the, uh, the seasonal patterns first documented by uh, Nakamura and Steinson in the US data in a very uh, well-known paper in 2008. Um, and they showed a, a very substantial seasonal component in price changes for both consumer and producer goods in the US. And this slide just reproduces one of the charts from their paper showing the median frequency of price changes. Uh, uh, price, the median frequency of price increases and decreases by month over the period from 1988 to uh, 2005. And so what you can see uh, is that the frequency of price changes declines monotonically uh, over the course of the calendar year, being highest in the first quarter of the year and lowest in the fourth quarter. Furthermore, the frequency of price changes tends to be highest in the first month of each quarter and uh, declines over the course of each quarter. Uh, and third, price increases play a disproportionate role in generating seasonality in price changes. Um, Nakamura and Steinson were very careful to distinguish between price changes associated with sales and what they term regular price changes. And this is a really important point for people who are not familiar with these really detailed micro data, uh, something to which uh, I'll return to shortly. Uh, what they showed that the seasonal pattern in sales price changes is actually very different from the seasonal pattern in so-called regular price changes. Uh, this uh, slide just reproduces uh, figure six from uh, Nakamura and Steinson's paper showing the high degree of seasonal variation in uh, 
the frequency of sales, especially in the apparel category, which is one of the top there in the United States. So uh, apparel is one of these notoriously difficult categories of goods to deal with, both in terms of the sales and then the frequency frequency with which new products are introduced and old products disappear. They, this, this, ha this churning happens at an extraordinary rapid pace in apparel. So uh, as noted, uh, the data in this paper is from a database of prices collected at a daily frequency. That's something that makes this paper kind of interesting compared to the earlier work. So Nakamura and Steinson were using monthly data from uh, the US CPI research database. Uh, there's a, another paper more uh, uh, by Eichenbaum, Jamovich, and Rebello that also use scanner data, but I think that was at the weekly frequency. So this is kind of in interesting. These guys go to the daily frequency, which is about, well, I guess you could go to hourly or continuous time data, but this, this is actually a pretty in interesting advance over what those earlier papers um, uh, did. So the raw data, you've got 11 billion individual records at the 13 digit level, which is then aggregated to the three digit level for the analysis in the paper. So the data exclude fresh food, recreational durable goods and services categories, but nevertheless cover uh, about one fifth of expenditures in the Japanese CPI as of uh, 2020. Now, highly disaggregated uh, scanner data needs some cleaning before they can be used to document uh, facts about price changes. And the first fact has to do with this product substitutions issue. This actually came up in the earlier discussion by uh, Jimmy Tamura uh, talking about uh, Raphael's paper earlier on, where you've got this churning of products, new products coming in and old products being replaced. Uh, how do you deal then with the price changes associated with these things? Uh, what the authors do in this paper is uh, uh, something that Rebello, Jamovich, and Eichenbaum did. You just apply a, a mode filter uh, by excluding, uh, sorry, you, you exclude uh, products that are not sold continuously for, I think, a full year plus uh, uh, three months. Um, the second issue then that needs to be addressed is this issue of um, um, high frequency sales. This picture just uh, illustrates the problem using a, a chart from the working paper version of the Eichenbaum, Jamovich, and Rebello paper. Uh, and this is from U.S. scanner data, weekly U.S. scanner data uh, over the period from 2004 to 2006. And you just see these, you know, wrapped ups and downs, the frequency with which sales occur. And you've got to be very careful. How do you interpret these things? Is this real price flexibility in the sense in which matters for macroeconomics or not? Are things that need to be uh, filtered out? Uh, what what, what uh, Rebello and company did and what these guys did is you just apply a mode filter. Uh, to take as the basic unit of observation, the modal price observed over uh, an 89-day uh, uh, window. Uh, they report four, uh, four main results, which uh, um, I'm going to kind of skip over because that's already been talked about. Um, and then they examine the implications uh, of their findings for a very standard model of uh, menu costs uh, of the sort that was examined in Nakamura and Steinson, which built on earlier models of Barrow, Shashinsky, Weiss, and Golaso and Lucas. Uh, they uh, look at the potential for seasonal variation in men menu costs and marginal production costs to um, generate the patterns they see in the data and show that really it's the model with seasonal variation in menu costs that seems to have the greatest potential to replicate the facts they they document. Um, <clears throat> this um, kind of raises the question of why there would be seasonal variation in menu costs of changing prices and how you might document this seasonal variation independently. Now, it surely can't be the case that the literal cost of changing prices, uh, reprinting menus and so on, changes over the course of the year. Um, is something else having to do with pricing decisions as they alluded to in the discussion, such as either budget cycles must be driving this. And it would certainly be worth delving into this uh, in future research. Uh, in fact, for, it's kind of ironic for the data used in this paper, this is all scanner data. I mean, these are pretty, these is about as costless as you can get to change prices using these uh, point of sale uh, technology that's now almost ubiquitous. Um, I've just three other comments uh, then on the paper. Um, uh, one, um, I, I just I was curious, you, you, it'd be interesting to see what's going on with quantities here. You see exactly the same uh, seasonal pattern with quantities. Uh, could looking at quantities shed some light on what the fundamental mechanism is? Is this fundamentally a demand or uh, uh, supply uh, phenomenon? Uh, 
they mentioned in the liter literature review the um, Barsky and Myron stuff. So it would be a simple task just to document what's going on with quantities. I mean, they have all this data already uh, in the raw database. Um, you know, it's interesting we don't have uh, some of the categories where you'd expect seasonality to be most important, like fresh food is not included here, uh, but still would be worth digging into. A second question is, to what degree uh, is the synchronization and seasonal price changes associated with the degree of substitutability uh, between goods? Uh, is it the case that seasonality and synchronization is stronger for goods that are closer substitutes or goods that are closer complements? I don't know. I mean, the comparison of tofu and soap struck me as kind of interesting. I don't know. I mean, they're obviously not substitutes, but um, why would the, the pricing decisions for tofu and soap actually be synchronized? Uh, at the same uh, over years. Um, and then the last thing I, I've just mentioned is uh, the issue of generalize, generalizability and how this either is stable over time or applies to other categories of goods. So this picture just uh, reproduces a um, two charts from figure one of the paper panel C uh, showing the pattern of changes, price changes by months in the US consumer price index for commodities, less food and energy over two five-year periods from uh, 1990 to 94 and 2000 to 2004. And you do see the, the pretty striking seasonal pattern, uh, very similar to what they document uh, uh, in Japan. So in the US, prices tend to rise in March and September and fall in the summer months of June and July. But uh, both of these periods, by the way, are periods of low and actually falling inflation. The data underlying uh, these charts uh, go back to 1957, so you can just average over time to see what the seasonal pattern looks like over nearly half a century. And again, you see the same pretty robust seasonal pattern, which is the non-seasonally the non adjusted data there is the red. And then, of course, the blue line is the seasonally adjusted series, which you would like to think exhibits no seasonality, and it doesn't. So that's good news. But if you look at the uh, sub-periods, it's a little bit less obvious um, that there is a stable pattern, uh, especially if you look at what happened um, during the recent COVID lockdown reopening and subsequent inflation surge. So the seasonal patterns that we observed, at least in the US data, seem to have been completely disrupted. And it was just absolute chaos during COVID, the reopening and the subsequent inflation surge. So I don't think this is much of a surprise to anybody here. But again, it might be interesting to see with this much more detailed Japanese data, do you see something similar in the pattern? And then what does this tell, if you really believe the menu cost story, then what really was going on with menu costs uh, during this period that caused these patterns to be disrupted? And then secondly, what's going on with other categories of consumer spending? So these last two charts um, show you the average monthly change in the prices for two other broad categories of US consumer spending. Um, services, less energy services and food at home. And again, prices for core services in the US tend to rise a lot more in January than they do in other months of the year, uh, and especially more than they do in December. And you see something similar for uh, food at home. And again, if you're gonna put a lot of weight on the idea of seasonality and menu costs as a key driver of seasonality in price changes for the, the, the other category of spending, you might wonder, well, why are these menu costs so different for food and for services and so on? So. We need to dig a little bit deeper, I think, I think on, on, the, on this issue. So uh, the last thing is, um, uh, if you look over long periods of time, I would guess you're gonna see some changes in these patterns. I know food is not included in, in, in the study here, but you gotta think that the growth in global trade has gotta have completely diminished, or at least severely uh, dampened seasonal cycles that would have existed prior to the invention of global trade, easy, you know, refrigerated transportation and so on. Uh, so it would, might be interesting to, to dig into that a bit further. But I will stop there and uh, compliment the authors on a great paper. Thank you. So uh, thanks both uh, Dr. Sudo and Dr. Wang uh, for the uh, excellent presentations and uh, great discussions and sharing price changes in both Japan and uh, US as well. So um, uh, before we uh, proceed further, let me uh, recognize that you know, we have a car so also sitting um, at the front seat. Um, they are um, Dr. Uh, Monokata from BOJ and um, Professor uh, Shirazuka from the University of Keio. 
So um, before I open up the floor for audience raising questions, uh, uh, Dr. Zuto, maybe you should, or, or, the, or the authors, uh, co-authors can uh, address any of the, uh, the questions raised by, uh, by Mark. Mark, thank you very much for the detailed comments. Uh, I'll try to reply some of the question, the comments you raised. So for the quantity things, so you're right. I mean, our price measure is indeed constructed from sales divided by quantity. So we have the numbers for quantities. And if you look at the season cycles or quantities for, uh, for tofu or other um, goods we look at, then we have increases in, in December. I don't know for the case of tofu actually, but the, for most of the categories. So we have, uh, yeah, so on the one hand, we have increases in uh, con expenditure in December. But tricky thing is that we look at the, uh, not the raw price itself, but we look at regular prices. And we sort of artificially create the, the, re the regular prices. And the, I don't know whether the, our measure of the season cycles of quantity really corresponds to our measure of prices. So we make adjustment to prices. So probably we need to make some adjustment to quantities as well. And the, for the supply and demand thing, so uh, if you believe in increase in December for quantity, and if during that time, because there are no um, noticeable increases in prices, that may mean that demand factor hasn't played an important role. And the, if you look at the season cycles of price uh, dynamics, themselves, as I show in the presentation, season cycle of price changes uh, nearly track the movement of seasonal cycles of net frequency. And if you are royal to the menu cost model, that is a simple reflection of seasonal cycles of menu cost. I'm a bit hesitant to say that the menu cost represents supply factor because it's nothing to do with the usual supply factors, which is the cost. And the, there may be some interaction between supply and demand in a sense that the uh, although subtle in the data, we see that whenever you have higher inflation rate for a specific category, I mean, low frequency movement, annual inflation rate for a uh, high annual inflation rate for for example, for tofu, then ups and downs. I mean, seasonal, uh, the magnitude of seasonal cycles tend to increase. So um, if the demand plays some role in generating the low frequency movement or price changes, then that could be um, assessed as that the demand, cycle, demand factor is playing a certain role. And you mentioned the uh, substitutability uh, and or complementarity or heterogeneity across categories. So broadly speaking, we see that for nearest all, almost all categories, we see two peaks in, in terms of frequency or price changes for both ups and downs, including food and non-food goods. And the um, and I think we need to start with the exploring the, the key determined. I mean, clearly there are some differentials across categories, but we don't know a good determinant uh, to differentiate. I mean, I don't know really what generates the heterogeneity uh, across a price, seasonal patterns of season, uh, price dynamics across categories. And for the generalization, so uh, I agree, and you mentioned already that the, um, the price, season cycles collapse during crisis times. And we saw that in the Lehman crisis. And also uh, we haven't showed here, but uh, there are some um, collapsing for seasonal patterns of prices in 2000 and beyond. But as you pointed out, it is consistent with menu costs. If you have large shocks, far larger than many costs you have to pay, then everything goes to flip, 
the, the flexible economy and the seasonal patterns, yeah, it, it's natural that seasonal cycles collapse. And for the uh, generalization to the category, so um, you've shown that for the case for the United States, um, there are some categories that do not exhibit seasonal cycles or the seasonal patterns similar to the goods we are looking at. And for the case of Japan, we, if you look at the monthly changes of prices um, for, um, for all items, namely goods and services, for goods, you have two peaks, March and September. But if you include services, you have peaks in April and September. So there may be some uh, subtle differences for uh, specific categories. Probably services have some different uh, seasonal patterns, but that's beyond our, the scope of our data. And for uh, geographically, I, I think you show this solar, solar system looking from the North Pole. And the, I've been uh, studying some uh, seasonal cycles in the United States and several countries. But probably I'm, I have to ask uh, Dr. Bichi, but uh, maybe like seasonal cycles in uh, South Sphere may look differently, but which we don't know. Um, yeah, I think I cover more or less of the comments we received, but thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, additional comment from Carl, sir? One, one more. Sure. So, about the policy implications. So the so there is a two two types of implications. So one needs the timing of the sh policy shocks and timings of the price and wage adjustment. So synchronization of the time these two timings may be matters. But uh, thinking about uh, uh, synchronization of price adjustment wage adjustment, and the businesses companies do not. Uh, decide those changes immediately, but they are preparing those those things in advance, targeting the March or September, etc. So the in my impression, so those those kind of the uh, much more longer term uh, issues are much more important things like uh, much more doing uh, co consistent policy policies over time based on some kind of the uh, uh, consistent. Policy, policy, policy rules, etc. So, looking at those kind of the much more longer term impact, maybe matters a lot. And one small comment about the uh, price adju price adjustment, a uh, price price setting behavior in the COVID nineteen eras, like uh, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, pandemic period. So the, in Japan, so the situation is very different from the U.S. There are not we, we had not so much stockouts, stockouts, etc. Most of the uh, shelves are not empty, and so the very different thing is the uh, uh, frequency of temporary sales declined significantly. So the people are choosing much more near, uh, shops nearby, more uh, and minimizing the shopping time, etc. So th those things are very, di a little bit different, I think, compared with the U.S. Thank you, thank you both for the uh, the uh, comprehensive feedback. The floor is open. Uh, let me have uh, first Professor Rafael Schuller, and followed by Professor Mike uh, Michael uh, McMullen. Rafael, you have the floor. Yeah, I I have maybe a, a clarifying question. So I I I. I I apologize if I missed this. You, you have daily data or you have monthly data. It seems like you couching your results in terms of like monthly, uh, but maybe there's a lot more we can you can tell us here. Um, you know, is this is like like March first. Is a couple of days in March. This 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 is something you can you can tell us. And also asking because I remember there's this paper, uh, I think by Bonomo and Cortes. They use Israeli data, and they find it's sort of like peak days when about ten percent of the products in in and large retailers sort of adjust on like very few days. So maybe that's, that's something that you can generalize here that, that's interesting for, for modeling. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rafael. Um, uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think this is super interesting. Um, 
I have two sort of comments. One is you also have data at the store level. And so building on what Raphael just said, you know, you put this story forward at the end that there's some kind of herding or coordination in these particular months. I mean, you could track which stores move first, how they move. And I think an interesting thing to go uh, to try and give a partial answer to, to Mark's question, you know, why would soap and tofu move together or in opposite directions or whatever they do? Uh, a former colleague of mine who at Warwick, who's now retired, but he had this work in the JME that showed that actually stores behavior is typically driven by not maximization of profit by good, but by, by sort of aggregate store level behavior. So, so you get a lot of interesting things like you put one price up by 20 cents, but you put 19 prices down by one cent, uh, such that you make more profit overall, but you can still go on TV and tell everyone we've cut 19 prices, but, but you know, there's that one price that goes up and things like loss leaders that, that marketers have thought about. So I think looking at the store level and the daily level, you could really sort of start to tell wh how coordinated those things are. So, so the, other, the other general comment is, I mean, you have daily data, so I'm, I'm now asking for more, which is a bit cruel. But if you had data on costs, of course, you could really see whether things are interesting. So one sort of rare, really simple reason why prices might all move in March or mostly move in March and September is that there's some cost effect that's coming uh, in, in March and September. So it'd be worth looking at some of the big costs or even just look at things like oil price moves. And there's big oil price moves. Do they feed into the price changes you would expect? What are the lags? I think there's a ton of sort of interesting uh, questions that that you could uh, you could start to get at with that. So um, yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, for both of you uh, for the questions. So feedback. Yeah. Thank you for the comments. So yeah, we'd like to have the data for uh, marginal cost, of course. But the uh, I have one question. One, I think the. Uh, Marginal costs do not may not play an important role in generating the season cycles of price change we've seen, uh, precisely because like if, if you just uh, stick to menu cost model for example, then then the um, if the changes in marginal costs is a key determinant of the season cycles, then you should have the positive correlation for the size and the frequency. But what we observe is the opposite. So you need to have some tricky distribution for marginal cost if you have the uh, changes in uh, marginal cost behind the season cycles of prices. So whenever, what, what is tricky in our observation is that whenever a larger portion of firms change the prices, they change little. So magnitude of the change is small. But if the marginal cost changes is driving those season cycles, then that should increase the size of price changes. I, I, I may be mistaken, sorry. But, uh, no, but if you combine it with my first point, you can imagine uh -huh. a world where you have this big marginal cost change. And so you put up a few prices a lot, but then you cut a few and you take a little margin hit on those. It's not obvious that the same logic. Mm -hmm. goes through which, which which i think your logic is based at a sort of product level profit maximization right, right. yeah whereas when you're when you're optimizing at the basket or the overall store level i think it's not as clear that's true anyway. that, that, that that's true thanks yeah and the, uh yeah we'd like to look at the store level or the um uh, i don't know regional level grocery store level so uh yeah i mean whole things probably speaks to the issues of the uh, coordination or synchronization and the, um, yeah, I mean, the measure of frequency itself is a measure of the synchronization and the um, further details on the, um, on the, the price dynamics um, is, is really uh, interesting research going forward, I think. Okay, thank you. So one last question from Governor Hamino. Thank you. I'd like to ask about the implication on the Bank of Japan monetary policy meeting calendar setting. And um, uh, we have eight meetings a year, but um, your study seems to suggest decision at certain meeting may be more effective than other meetings. And um, 
Well, I don't necessarily welcome you suggesting additional meeting in August, <laughs> but uh, if you suggest reduction from eight to two, maybe <laughs> I might like the proposal. Um, Shirakawa-san, Shiratsuka-san's comment may have already partially covered the question, but if you have any additional uh, comments or suggestions, I would welcome that. Thank you. Um, so. Please, how many uh, board meetings? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the comment. So uh, I think the one takeaway from the analysis is that we need to look at the data carefully, especially in March, April, and September. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to neglect all of the variables during that time, but uh, so uh, because the, um, there are specific months that tend to reflect a larger um, information, probably relative to other months. And the, um, currently we are looking at the development of the uh, renegotiation of wages, and probably we are going to see that closely next year as well. So uh, yeah, so our, um, I think the result is hopefully silent about the calendar schedule of the uh, FO, uh, the NPM meeting, but it uh, has implications for, uh, I mean, whenever you are in March and April or September, October, you need to be slightly more careful about price changes. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, after we discuss the uh, the price of the tofu, I think we have opportunities to taste the tofu. Um, I don't know the menu, um, but the uh, opportunities. Looking forward to. Um, before we do that, uh, let's uh, thank uh, the our speakers' uh, discussions once again uh, with another round of applause.